how did I get here? I grew up in Mississippi, and in Mississippi, four of the five food groups are sugar. There's white sugar, and there's brown sugar, and there's confection sugar, and Little Debbie Snacking Cakes has its own food group in Mississippi. <laughs> When I grew up, the wall of the grocery store with Little Debbie Snacking Cakes, which is like Twinkies, Moon Pies, was as big as the produce wall. And that's a really big message to a young person. It's like, this is an important food group. And so, so and then everything else was stuffed into a food group, you know, things nobody really did, like vegetables and things like that. So um, you won't be surprised to know that I grew up on allerg allergy shots and antibiotics. My head hurt, my stomach hurt, I couldn't think. Um, my life was just a constant stream of earaches and um, failure to thrive. But there wasn't anything really wrong with me. And so consequently, I couldn't breathe well because I had all these allergies. And so my nose was stopped up all the time, so I was a mouth breather. So I I couldn't sleep well. So I had all these issues that resulted in just an inability to focus at all. I didn't do well in school because I couldn't think. I, I, I couldn't breathe, I couldn't think, I couldn't digest food. And it impacted my self-esteem in such a huge way as a, a young person. And I just, I, I would just look around and I'd be like, why, why are some people thriving and some people not? Why, why can these people thrive and I can't thrive? Like, what's the, what's the difference? You know, there's obviously enough life force here for everyone to thrive. Why aren't I thriving? And so this, I limped along for decades. It was um, in 25, I moved from the South to New York City, and I was working for this huge publishing company, and finally had a little money. And uh, so I went to see everybody. I spent all the money I had in going to see um, all sorts of different practitioners. My friends would say, why are you doing this? We have such great insurance here. And um, you know, when you're 25, you're spending your money on clothes and cars, and people were investing in Yahoo at that time. It's like, I'm my investment. I'm all I have. I won't be here 20 years from now if I can't find my way out of this. And I have no hope. Like, I just, I just get through the day, and then I go home. Like, I can't, I can't find any inspiration, and I don't want to go on like this. So I went to see everybody. I tried everything. And I found all sorts of interesting things, lots of things I liked. And at the end of the road, I walked into the Ayurvedic practitioner's office. And I said, I don't know what this is, but do what you can do, because I've been to see everybody else. And they took my pulse and looked at my tongue and my eyes and heard me talk and said, you know, your blood sugar's off, your circadian rhythm's off, your digestion is off, you can't detoxify. And they taught me how to reset these things through diet and daily practices. They gave the power to me to fix it. And I was so impressed with the Vedic science of Ayurveda, the science, Ayurveda is the science of life, the study of nature, the art of living, and yoga is the science of meditation, with the way these ancient sciences has, had turned my life around. That at that time, I was working for the Wall Street Journal. I quit my job at the Wall Street Journal to go study Ayurveda and yoga. And my grandmother was devastated. She told everybody in Mississippi I worked for the Wall Street Journal. And then I was leaving to go do this thing no one had ever heard of. But Ayurveda had recovered my dreams. It saved my dream. Like Mo Digliani says, you have one real duty in life, and that's to save your dream. I had no dream when I couldn't get through the day because of energy imbalances and deficiency and not being able to sleep. And so once I was able to just heal my body and clear my mind and connect to nature, it all changed. So all I wanted to do was share this ancient sacred knowledge. And so Ayurveda is actually the oldest continuously practiced healthcare system in the world. It comes from the Vedic text. The Rig Veda is the oldest book in the world. And the reason it's lasted all this time, it's been passed around the world and built, and built all this momentum as it works. It's simple and it's gentle and it works. And what it is is the, the study and honoring of nature. And we're a part of nature. I grew up thinking nature was something outside the window. I thought it was the Jaguar and the Discovery Channel TV show. That was nature. And when I was a young adult, I was like, oh, I'm a part of nature. And the reason I'm sick is I disconnected myself from the mother, mother nature. And I didn't know how to reconnect. I was eating fake foods and staying up late in electronics. I wasn't dressing warm enough in winter and wasn't eating seasonally. Ayurveda and yoga taught me how to reconnect to nature. And so... What I learned after years of practicing Ayurveda and yoga and studying Ayurveda and yoga, is this uh, making noise here? 
the microphone? Is there something I should do? Okay. Okay. Sorry. That's annoying for when you're... Okay, I'm not going to touch it. <laughs> so, so I, by healing myself with an Ayurvedan yoga, I answered my question of why is it that some people thrive and some people don't? even though there's plenty of life force in the universe for everyone to thrive. And what is life force? What am I talking about? Well, in Ayurveda, we call it prana. Chinese mesma call it chi. Uh, Egyptians would call it ka. Um, Christians would call it Holy Spirit. Scientists would call it biophotons from the sun. But it's pretty, every culture has a name for this thing. It comes from the sun and powers all the living beings. And it's, we call it prana. And so that's the common denominator between me and you and all living things on earth. And so at the core of all this is how are we going to reconnect to our birthright of bringing in this prana, connecting to this life force. And so it comes down to two things. Um, connecting to nature, moving with the rhythms and cycles of nature. We're a part of nature. And so a good example of this is in 2005 there was um, a tsunami in Sri Lanka. And 24 hours before the tsunami, there had been an earthquake way out in the middle of the ocean. And so the people didn't know it was coming. But they have footage. They're like, wow, isn't this strange? Elephant, elephants are stampeding from the water. Hippos are running up, the, up the, the mountain. How come by the time the tsunami came, all the animals were up at high ground? And the people were shocked that a tsunami was coming. They didn't know. Because if, you, if you're forced to live off the land, if you're forced to forage for your food, if you're, that's how you survive, you'll get connected to the life force, to the, to the constant flow of well-being in the universe. Because otherwise you wouldn't make it. And so they had a habit of connecting to nature and listening to nature's cues and listening to their body. They knew how to do it because that's how they survived. And so they didn't cognate about, let's go up the hill. They just found themselves going up the hill. They just found themselves at high ground by the time the tsunami came. And what I found is that I had trained myself out of that. My culture had trained me out of being connected to the, the rhythms and cycles of nature, to the constant flow of well-being that's all of our birthright. You're part of and heir to all the treasures of the universe, but you have to agree to receive them. You have to know how to connect. So that's what I needed to do. I needed to relearn what these you know, animals had, had never gotten away from because they had to do it to survive. And Ayurveda taught me that. So, instead of, so you have to connect. And it's really the answer is through nature, by moving with nature. But you have to be able to take it in. You have to know how to hold it. You look at a baby. I mean, they're just glowing with prana. Nobody has to teach them how to hold it. But you just stare. Like, they're just this. It's so attractive. Like, flowers have so much prana. You know when you see something with prana. And so it's about knowing how to hold it and becoming a clear and efficient channel. The fulfillment of your highest potential is direct, directly proportional to your ability to function as a clean and efficient channel. And so we're born clean and efficient channels. You're, you're born a detox machine, but we get away from that if we don't move with nature. And so it's how are we gonna return to being the clean and efficient channel that we were born to be? That's what Ayurveda and yoga taught me. And so, before we go into some actual practices, um, we're gonna, um, I'm gonna just tell you a little bit about prana. So prana, it moves all over the body, but it's located in the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus is a gland, it's often called the master gland that's in the brain. And it, um, it is special in that it connects the nervous system and the endocrine system. Be very hard to be mindful if your nervous system and endocrine system are we're fried and off balance. And so we really need, the, the hypothalamus is the seat of prana, and we need it to be filled with prana so that it can do its job. And the hypothalamus rules the pituitary, which is the band master of the endocrine system. The hormones are the small hinge that open the big door. It's very, very difficult to be your real self, your true self, when the hormones are, are really off. So we need prana. And the brain, it requires more prana, more oxygen than any other part of the body and it requires a lot of blood. And so that's why in the Vedic text they say before you meditate, you should do pranayama, which is focused breath work, because you're bringing lots of uh, prana, prana to the hypothalamus and to the brain. When the brain is deficient in prana, 
someone becomes restless and disturbed, uh, it's easy to move in you know, depression and anxiety and nervousness and insomnia and being trapped in negative thinking. And if once you disconnect, you really don't have enough prana, it's just hard to think and talk. You know, it, it's just deficiency of this fuel, this common de denominator between all, you know, all living beings on Earth. Like, you have to have enough. So the most effective way to deliver more prana to the, ba the brain is through stimulating the frontal lobe of the brain through conscious breathing. It's the, the fastest and most effective way. And then the other seats of prana in the body are the heart as well as the blood. And so we have a very heavy focus on the blood in Ayurveda because um, that's what's going to nourish your cells. How do you create good blood, good digestion, and good detoxification? Because you're not what you eat. You're what you can digest, what you can absorb, and what you can't let go of. And so we have a heavy focus on helping someone heal their digestion and helping them open their detox channel so they can let go of what they don't need. So they have a really high quality blood to go nourish their cells. Like there's a billion cells inside of you just waiting, waiting on this blood to come nourish them. And so it depends on digestion and detoxification.